Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. Please be seated. We now come to the third case on today's docket, Allen versus the State of Florida. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Lisa Bort and I represent Margaret Allen. Ms. Allen's convictions and death sentence should be Please based. speak into the mic so we can hear okay, you. I'm sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Allen's convictions and death sentences should be vacated because they are not supported by competent and substantial evidence. Only two aggravators were independently found by the trial court, and the only support for the aggravators were the testimony of the co-defendant, Quinton, who took a plea deal and is already out of prison, and the testimony of Dr. Kaiser, who is a medical examiner who did not perform the victim's autopsy and testified that unconscious people feel pain. Correct me if I'm wrong, but we're here on post-conviction, not on the direct appeal. We already Correct. affirm based on sufficiency of evidence in the initial appeal. Correct. Um, in post-conviction, not only was it brought to light that trial counsel did not perform a constitutionally adequate mitigation investigation and that a statutory mitigator did exist, but the testimony of both Quinton and Dr. Kaiser was undermined, which in turn would undermine the hack aggravator as well. So that's why it is important that there was only two aggravators that were found at trial. Can you explain, because I was trying to understand it, the, uh, they did put on two expert witnesses at trial. Uh, the, what, were there records that you, just, that were not discovered, either school records or medical records that were then discovered and used in post-conviction? So just on the issue of records, school records, medical records, psychological records, what's the, what is the difference in what wasn't discovered, if anything? Before, the, uh, before trial or, and what you've now found and able to give to the expert witnesses? Um, the, some of the experts at trial did have some records. However, none of the um, experts at trial actually spoke to any of Ms. Allen's family. Okay, no, but I just asked you about records. So mm -hmm. they were, they were, you didn't, they found and used all available records. You, it's not a case of where the investigation failed to reveal records. I mean, there was not some records that did come out in post-conviction, but there was a decent amount of records. Okay, that so you're not making a claim about the failure to investigate records. Not records per se, but for instance, Dr. Gebel, who was. Um, one of the experts that did testify at trial, he had no idea what even the details of the crime were. So in terms okay, of- Okay, but now we're getting into some other issues. So on the fact that the experts did not know the details of the crime, what did the trial attorney say about, uh, was it a strategic decision to, because the details of the crime obviously are pretty horrendous, uh, was there a strategic reason for not if they were going to be testifying about extreme emotional distress, if at least one of them was, for not telling the expert about the details of the crime? There was not. Um, Mr. Bankowitz was a trial counsel. He actually took the case over about two and a half years prior to trial, so he didn't hire the experts. The experts were already previously hired by the public defender's office um, when Ms. Allen had them as her attorneys. So he didn't provide them any additional records after he came on the case or um, have them talk to any of the family members. I know you, or no, let's stay with just the question about the details of the crime. Was, was there a reason if they were, if it was at least have one expert testify to a statutory mitigator, mm -hmm. which would have to, you'd have to know something about the crime Correct. to know, to relate it, why he didn't, you know, sometimes there's a strategic reason for not going over the details of the crime. Either the expert didn't want uh, the details. Can you, is anything in the record about that? Um, trial counsel actually, just 
thought that everything that was already done was sufficient. In essence, he thought that the mitigation was ready to be just put on. So he didn't do so for the two and a half years that he, after he took over, he didn't do anything additional? Um, he spoke to Myrtle Hudson, who was Miss Allen's aunt, and in essence tried to delegate some of the mitigation to her and tried to have her bring some of Allen's family to um, him and bring him to his office. But he even when he did speak to, for instance, one of the other aunts, Miss Capers, who actually had a lot to say in post-conviction about Miss Allen's abusive childhood. But didn't he actually say that he had attempted to contact other people, uh, he either couldn't reach them or something, but he did, in fact, testify at the evidentiary hearing of other things that he had done uh, to try to get other witnesses. Isn't, isn't the, doesn't the record reflect that? Um, just what I spoke of with uh, Miss Hudson. So in essence, he had Miss Hudson get some people and bring them to the office. Um, I believe he just spoke to those people. Um, he was also hired by the brother. So Miss Allen's brother, I believe he spoke to briefly, but none of them testified. He had no notes of anything um, of that. So what, what do you consider um, to be a significant difference between what was presented in the penalty phase with two um, experts and now coming out in post-conviction. What is the significant difference between the two presentations? Well, the presentation that was provided in post-conviction paints a much darker picture of Miss Allen's childhood. Um, none of the child abuse that she suffered came out at trial at all. So no one knew about any of that. No one knew that her the mother aunt didn't talk about any childhood issues in her testimony in the, in the trial? Just that she moved from house to house, um, but it made it sound like she was being protected at these homes, not that she was being sexually abused, not that her mother was holding her head under water, not that her grandfather was lining up all the children and beating them one by one until they bled. Let me ask you about that. Didn't because the, it, I'm sorry, didn't just, the experts testify to the childhood abuse? Just that there was some abuse in the, uh, excuse me, not abuse, but just that the neighborhood, that there was. Um, the I thought the experts testified that she was abused physically. Not specifically. Um, one of the experts, um, Dr. Gebel, said that there was a potential possible sexual abuse. But in fact, when it was even found in the mitigators and that the trial court did give that some weight that it was possible sexual abuse. Whereas in post-conviction it was found not only was she sexually battered by her brother and there was a police report that did show that that was available at the time of trial so that could have came out at that point. Her grandfather also abused her, uh, or excuse me, sexually abused her. So did her uncle as well as another man. So it's a very different picture. Well I asked you earlier painted. about records. So now mm -hmm. you're telling me there were records of things that happened during her childhood mm -hmm. that were not discovered? They actually were discovered, just no one testified about them. So they, were they shown to the experts? I, I believe Dr. Gabel did have the um, police report or the hospital records, one of the two regarding her brother sexually battering her, and that's why I said there was a possible sexual abuse. What is the quality of uh, the testimony? You said that there, the aunt that wasn't called was Barbara Capers. Correct. Uh, the aunt that testified was Myrtle Hudson. Wh what was the reason, because it looks like Barbara Capers gives very specific uh, and uh, extensive wit um, testimony about what she personally observed. What was the reason given for not calling, because there's some others that said they would, Barbara Capers, you said he knew about Barbara Capers? Did he make a strategic decision to go with Myrtle Hudson? What was the testimony on that? He only went with Myrtle Hudson. Um, he did speak with Miss Capers, but he never actually asked Miss Capers to testify. Well, but did he know? What I'm asking you is you have a burden to show mm -hmm. deficient performance. What was the testimony about why this lawyer would not put on what is ex extensive testimony about her childhood of abuse and uh, physical and sexual abuse. Uh, did he not, was she not cooperative? Was he didn't, he thought it would be duplicative of Myrtle H Hudson? Or was the question even asked of counsel? I believe the record reflects the fact that he 
thought he was fine with Ms. Hudson, he thought everything was fine with the mitigation, the way it stood with the experts, that everything he had was sufficient, and he just didn't go any further with that because Ms. Capers actually went to trial and she did want to testify, but she just had no idea that it would even help because from the limited discussions that she had with trial counsel, I don't think he asked her the right questions, in my opinion. So he didn't know the extent of the abuse that they had all suffered and that Ms. Capers could actually testify about the fact that she had witnessed that as well. So there wasn't a situation where the, ex uh, where the lawyer said, you know, I looked at this, I thought there could be a downside in the jury hearing something, mm -hmm. nothing like that. Not with Ms. Capers. He did um, say things about some of the other witnesses that he thought that he might not want to call them for certain reasons. However, he didn't even interview the other witnesses. For instance, the children, he didn't even interview them. So he had no idea if there was any reason to call well, them not or not. I, mean, the I think there were valid reasons for not putting on the children. And so I am really just was focusing on Barbara Capers. So how in qualitatively did the uh, Dr. Russell um, ch change the picture of uh, the mental mitigation in this case? Well, Dr. Russell actually was able to speak to the family members and he was able to find out more of the symptoms of PTSD that in the past was not ever uncovered because of the fact that no one spoke with the family. Um, and also at trial, Dr. Gebel testified, however, he only had a very limited evaluation with Ms. Allen due to the fact that there was a guard in the room. And now, PTSD, <laughs> the crime here did not occur because there was some kind of a flashback. This was a crime that was occurred over hours and hours and hours and hours. So I am, while I might be sympathetic to some more interesting mitigation, how would that establish, how is that connected to what happened in this case? It's not like she killed a boyfriend or she, uh, you know, because he was trying to have sex with her or uh, that something traumatic triggered something. This is a, you know, whether the facts of this crime are, you know, an extensive time period where this victim was, I mean, just terrible. I don't, we don't need to go into the facts. So I don't, how is the connected up the PTSD would have established some kind of a overwhelming mitigation that would undermine confidence in the outcome of this case. So even if there was some deficiency, where is the, uh, the prejudice? Understand. Well, I mean, even with those facts, I mean, you would have to take Quentin's testimony as the truth and that it was credible, which we did also undermine post-conviction, which I have time, I'll, if I have time, I'll get to that as well. I'm having but, trouble hearing you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, in essence, for those facts, you would have to believe what Quentin, the co-defendant, said as well, which in post-conviction, we did undermine his testimony. So if I have time at the end, I will get to that. But to answer your question, in essence, what Dr. Russell said, the way that he explained it was that the extreme emotional disturbance was related to Ms. Allen's PTSD, and it left her vulnerable to emotional dysregulation when she was faced with the loss of her money. So the longer that she couldn't find her money, the more frustrated that she became. And as her emotional dysregulation escalated, she was unable to think logically and rationally, and she did not have the ability to handle the stressor without overreacting. So that's the way that he explained it. And he said he wouldn't have been able to find PTSD if it hadn't been for the fact that he did speak with her, the family because they were able to um, speak to a lot of the other symptoms that Margaret doesn't, um, she doesn't come forward with all the time because she does have avoidance symptoms as well, and she does have issues remembering a lot of her traumatic events, just like other PTSD. Um, and what did the trial, what did the trial court uh, say about that testimony? And um, the, the judges who heard the testimony, what did the judge say about that? Well, in essence, um, they. they apparently didn't find it credible because they decided not to grant relief, but we believe that their findings are not supported by competent and substantial evidence. Um, Dr. Gamash did testify. Um, he was the competing expert. However, Dr. Gamash did not do any evaluation of Miss Allen. He did not meet with any of her family members, even though he even agreed that that would have been helpful. Um, and it's always good to get a third party's report so you can see you know, if anything was missed in the self-report. And also he harped on um, a test that was taken, which is just 
basically taken in order to show consistency. So he's it looks like what the judge did out. on pages 73, 74, 75 uh, was compare the expert Dr. Russell with Dr. Kamash mm -hmm. and found that based on a lot of specifics that it was not, the PTSD was not a factor in the occurrence of this crime, isn't that, and the judge made a factual determination of the credibility of the two witnesses. Correct, and we just, we do not feel that that's supported by competent substantial evidence just due to all the factors that were testified about, um, that she did have all the symptoms, that the family members did corroborate those symptoms, and they did start prior to um, the crime, and they started even in her teens and into her 20s, a few witnesses did testify those symptoms so, even back so then. So if, if Dr. Russell's the one that said she had a post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. correct? And so how did he relate that to the crime? It seems to me that this, this person seemed to have gone through a lot of machinations to commit the crime, to cover it up, and all of this. And so how did he actually relate that diagnosis to how this crime was committed? In essence, it was the emotional dysregulation prong of the PTSD that as she became Please more... Please more... continue to keep your voice up. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, in essence, it was due to the emotional dysregulation part of the PTSD. So as she became more and more frustrated, she was unable to control herself at that point. So she lost the purse, and that all triggered this emotional reaction to kill the victim. The longer and longer that she couldn't find her money, it just escalated is the way that he described it. You, you are now one minute into your rebuttal time. Oh. You may keep going or not. I will reserve for rebuttal. Thank you very much. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Doris Meacham and I'm here on behalf of the state. I'd like to begin with the uh, PTSD diagnosis that uh, defense expert Dr. Russell made. His speculation of what was going on is that pure speculation. When he spoke to Ms. Allen, she actually denied the murder. She never went into specifics as to what happened that day. She never told him what was going on in her mind. So this the scenario that uh, Dr. Russell painted of her being in such emotional distress that she lost her purse and her money and that it just escalated was just him assuming that based on the facts of the case that were so given to him. He went to see her. He spoke to her. And did they, how long a period was this? Because it sounds like she was not cooperative. She was not cooperative. He spoke with her once, denied the murder and never gave specifics as to what occurred that day. So he based this off of what he knew from the police reports, the case file, and from speaking to family members. Um, as far as what their contribution was for the symptoms, again, were, were not really based on anything. They, they said that she had some anxiety, uh, that she had sweaty palms, um, that she slept a lot. There was nothing to corroborate the symptoms. The avoidance was this, that- uh, Were there testimony that she uh, uh, used drugs? There was testimony that she was involved with drugs, um, that she grew up in a neighborhood of drugs and violence. Uh, the fact that- But uh, there was no testimony that she was actually a user. A user of drugs. Dr. Gebel testified that she had an overdose back in 1989. That was brought out. During. It seems to me, I, I think, on the failure to uh, put on sufficient evidence of the extreme emotional distress. I, I, I don't see that as being uh, much of a point. There's two areas that concern me. One is this is uh, this was a woman that, if you listen now to the testimony of uh, Barbara Capers. Uh, had, it wasn't just growing up in a drug-ridden neighborhood. It appears that there was extreme violence uh, and personally to her in her upbringing that is quite detailed. Uh, I'm trying to understand 
as compared to Myrtle Hudson. Right. Uh, what that testimony is nothing like anything we had in the direct appeal. What was the lawyer's reason? I understand there were that he made some decisions as to the children. Right. Uh, but what what would be the reason for not detailing and there's police reports, whatever, this extreme history of abuse against her, domestic violence, you know, in well, relationships. Myrtle Hudson did testify to that. She didn't go into the specifics of the childhood abuse. She did mention the sexual abuse. As far as the domestic did violence. Did she not know about the beta you see I'm trying and again I gotta look and compare, but did she what was were there different you know, you have ants. I mean right. were there different relationships? Did one live with her and the other was well, as not far there? As Barbara Caper's testimony about the sexual abuse, this was basically all hearsay. She was only privy to actually one instance with the with the brother-in-law that she actually witnessed. And what did she witness? The uh, brother-in-law or the father-in-law that sexually abused her. But all the other ones were, were things that she had heard. How old was she when she was sexually abused uh, by the brother-in-law? That was in her teens, I believe, a younger. Is that not, uh, was, uh, did Myrtle, uh, did she have specifics? She did not have specifics. She said she was sexually abused as a child, but, but did is not Is that not, you know, and again, I'm not trying, I understand this may end up the same way. Just this, the, the uh, degree of detail in Myrtle, I'm sorry, Barbara Caper's testimony uh, so different than just saying you got you grew up in a drug-ridden neighborhood. Were there police? And what was, what about the well, police? Well, Myrtle report? Hudson did give specifics. I mean, she to what she witnessed as far as the defendant being pregnant at the time she was beaten so badly she went into the hospital. She was there to witness when she got there. The door was laying on top of her. She was there for other instances where she saw her face was swollen. But, but, where she isn't, had isn't it the case that the trial court? Uh, found uh, among the non-statutory mitigating circumstances, uh, one, that Alan was the victim of physical abuse and possible sexual abuse in the past. Correct. And that Alan has brain damage as a result of prior acts of physical abuse. Yes. Okay, All so, of that came out through the testimony. I mean, so that, that, those are, I, I mean, mean those, everything came out in the evidentiary hearing that came out in the evidentiary hearing came out during the penalty phase. And they found that. They found that she had at least 10 traumatic injuries that caused this brain injury to her. I that think what we're dealing with, and I appreciate, I've read the sentencing order, I've read the post-conviction order, I've read most of the testimony. You know, you have a unanimous jury verdict here. If you didn't, you would There'd be, be hearse time. relief. And I'm looking at this as not what the trial court asserted some way to, but what the qualitative testimony was about her into childhood and into her adulthood. And that's, you know, that it's a different, it's, it's not just that the trial court found it, because we're not, we're here on, to me, how would this have affected, uh, you know, the jury verdict. Right. And the post-conviction court held that basically the evidence that was presented was cumulative, that everything that came out was brought out by Myrtle Hudson. The sexual abuse was not brought out as detailed as Ms. Capers did, but there was mention of it and it was found as a non-statutory mitigator. And as far as why he only went with Myrtle Hudson, he testified that he reached out to family members. He had Ms. Hudson reach out to family members and they were uncooperative. He also mentioned that there was an aunt that was sick. Whether he didn't mention it by name, it may have been Ms. Capers, I don't know, but she was sick and she did not feel that she could testify. Ms. Caper said she was there during the trial. She was there with Ms. Hudson. She was there when the attorney asked Ms. Hudson to testify, yet she did not do anything. She did not come forward. She did not say, I want to speak on behalf of Ms. Allen. So it's a matter of you were there, you knew this was going on, and whether or not she was the one that said she couldn't take the stand because she was sick, that's what it sounds like. Was that asked to, uh, in the uh Evidentiary in hearing. the evidentiary hearing. She, just, she said that I was sick, that's why I didn't well, She said I was present during the time that the defense attorney was talking to Murder Hudson. Didn't she say I would have testified if the attorney asked me? If, if he would have asked her, right. But whether or not she was the one that was actually telling him that she couldn't testify, I don't know. He just mentioned speaking to two aunts, and there were only two aunts that were mentioned, Myrtle Hudson and Ms. Capers. So whether or not at the time Ms. Capers told him, I'm 
I'm not well enough to testify. I don't know because he couldn't remember her name. But again, the, the post-conviction court found that everything that came out during the hearing, evidentiary hearing, was brought out in front of the jury, um, except for the PTSD, which they really didn't find a basis for. And as far as, um, let's see, speaking to the doctors, I believe there was some um, assertion that he just took the case from the PD's office and didn't inquire into it. Um, uh, during the evidentiary hearing, Mr. Bankowitz did state that he got the mitigation from the PD's office. He spoke to the doctors, felt that they had done a sufficient job, and that's why he went forward with them. If you have any further questions, I believe I'm done. Thank you. I believe the record actually shows that Mr. Bankowicz actually um, said they tried to contact two of her sisters and that one of the sisters was sick. So I do not believe that he was referring to Miss Capers. Um, further, um, very brief mentions of sexual abuse wouldn't foreclose relief to Miss Allen. There's been other cases out there, such as Bevel and Ellerby, where there have been limited references regarding some sort of child abuse or sexual abuse and it did not foreclose relief due to the much darker picture that was painted in post-conviction. Uh, Miss Capers was the one that observed the physical child abuse. She observed the sexual abuse because she was going through the same thing. She was there at the same time that Miss Allen was also being abused. Whereas Miss Hudson, she did witness child abuse, but she was never asked about it at trial. And she was only asked that one brief mention about sexual abuse, but there was an objection as a predicate, so it ended up just getting glazed over the fact that she had been told about it. So she wasn't there for it anyhow. So Miss Capers would have actually been a really good witness for Mr. Bankowitz to put on. Um, further, there's How does that relate to, and I'm quoting from Jones versus State, a 2008 case, from this court. We've repeatedly held that counsel is not ineffective for failing to present cumulative evidence. And it sounds like, you know, Mr. Bankwitz did present evidence that was sufficient to get the findings that Justice Kennedy asked about earlier. And that the testimony, while it may have been more powerful um, in hindsight, would appear to be cumulative to the evidence that supported the findings. Well, I would say that the only thing that could even be any question of cumulative would be the domestic violence. There was some brief references to domestic violence that was at trial. But like I said, there was nothing in terms of child abuse that was presented at trial and only the very brief mention of um, sexual assault and nothing came up about her brother sexually bad airing her, even though there was police reports about that. Um, whereas... But, but those were the documents that were given to the expert and the expert testified to the possible sexual abuse. Correct. So no one actually testified whether that <coughs> happened, whether there was any other instances where there ended up being quite a few instances of sexual abuse, um, most of them perpetrated by Miss Allen's family. Um, um, also, another reason why this is so important is the fact that the hack aggravator was undermined in post-conviction as well. Dr. Spitz did testify um, that there were no ligature marks that were found on the victim, and he undermined quite a bit of Quentin Allen's testimony. Whereas if Quentin Allen was found not to be believable about the, the actual circumstances surrounding the victim's death, he might not have been credible. But she was terrorized for hours and hours before. I mean, it's not just the idea that she was, however she was strangled, it went on for how many hours? This it, uh, tying her up, telling, you know, hitting her and all that. That doesn't go into the, uh, the lead up that she f must have feared that she was going to die? It would if you believe Quentin. However, we believe based on the fact that his testimony was not credible in a lot of angles and that Dr. Spitz did discredit some of his testimony on top of that and that he should have been impeached further based on some of our other claims. If you don't believe that everything that Quentin has to say, there was no one else that was there that can testify to what happened in that room. So whether Quentin was the one that did it, whether Miss Allen had anything to do with it, we will never know because the only people that were there were her and Quentin, supposedly. So in terms of that, if you find that the hack aggravator Where was... was Mr. Martin in all of this? Wasn't there a Mr. Martin who also helped them with this, uh, this situation? 
Not until after the fact. He was in another room what, in the house what, what, and sleeping. Wasn't he there when the victim was first alive? He was, I believe, at one point, but he was in another room. He was sleeping. He was on drugs. He wasn't very credible in terms of any of that as well. Um, in essence, I would oh, your, just... Your time has now expired. If you want to sum up in about 30 seconds. Yes. Um, in essence, I would just ask that this court vacate Ms. Allen's convictions and death sentence and remand for a new trial. Thank you. We thank you both for your arguments. The court will now be in recess. All rise.